Oh, I might have a, a stick that's hit me every now and then, but I've been, I'm fine. I'm good. Thank you. Actually, it is really, really good to be with you. You guys have something special here. The Lord's up to many things all around the world. And so there's good stuff lots of places, but what you have here is very, very good. And, and I, I mean it very sincerely when I say I'm honored to get a, a chance to see that. Thanks, Jason, and, and to this congregation. You're also pretty um, brave. Um, you had me here four years ago, and the Sunday after I preached, you closed the church. Um, <laughs> I think you did, if I recall right. I think I, I think I was your last sermon before COVID, if I recall right, something along that line. So... Um, what I want to do with you today is take you to the Word, and I want to hit something really, really key. Uh, I'm going to hit a, a key concept. I, I recognize that a guy from the outside, there's times that you just need to say things because you are from the outside, and I got a car, and I go back to Missouri when the afternoon's over and all those sort of things, and, and, I, and I want to talk about that. I, I want to be very blunt. I do know my danger Here's my danger. As soon as I tell you what we're talking about, about two-thirds of you will want to check out mentally and go, oh, he's talking about somebody else. Because I'm going to use the word leadership. We're going to talk about leadership. And immediately, many people go, well, boy, I'm off the hook today. Um, he didn't talk about gluttony or something that would affect me. You know, so, so he's talking about leadership. That's not who I am. And I'm going to go, wrong, pilgrim. Wrong. No, I intend to get in your kitchen, every single one of you. Because you have to redefine what leadership means from a kingdom perspective and not from a world's perspective. Uh, with the word leadership, if the word leadership is here, I, I, I want you to know there's two streams that come to it. One stream is, quite frankly, just the word maturity. It is impossible for you to be a Christ follower and to actually come to maturity that I'm not talking about you this morning because God himself calls you into a maturity that will be leadership in your home, in your, in your job, in your neighborhood. And I'm not trying to use some just generic flowery language. Truth is you become a change agent for the world. God has no small goals for you. Nobody is here is invited just to become a Christian and just to be saved. Don't misunderstand me. Becoming a Christian and, 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 and being saved or made whole is an incredible blessing, but God never settles for that. One of my favorite passages, by the way, just on the side of maturity, is in what? Luke 6, probably Luke 6, verse 40, is the passage that says 39 and 40 that says, that A disciple, when he's been fully repaired, it's the Greek word katartizo. It's what the disciples were doing with their nets when Jesus came up. They were repairing their nets. Jesus said a disciple, when he's been fully repaired, will be like his master. The reality is radical transformation and radical impact of your life is required. Nobody is just a Christian. You're not. In fact, if I take you to the Sermon on the Mount and bring you on this road, he starts off, blessed are the poor in spirit, and blessed are those who mourn. He's talking to sinners who don't have their act together, and sinners who couldn't get their act together. And you say, oh, wow, there's a place for broken people to come to the kingdom, and there is. And then he goes two paragraphs later and says, and by the way, you will be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. What? Yeah. This place has no hope if you don't bring light. There's nobody in this room that is only or just. We, we, we could set that up as long as we want to. When you seek king, leadership and kingdom, it has almost nothing to do with title and office. It has to do with concept of getting it and understanding. I'm going to use an illustration here. I want you to visualize an iceberg. Can everybody see the iceberg here? Okay. If you can, I worry about you. Um, but there's an iceberg here, all right? And an iceberg has one-eighth or one-ninth is out of the water, depending on the oxygen content of the water. So that means seven-eighths is below the water and not seen. That means eight-ninths may be below the water and not seen. Kingdom leadership is the whole iceberg. Yes, you're going to have a certain portion, like Jason, are listed as leaders, visible. And you're going to have a portion, one-eighth, one-ninth out. But seven-eighths, eight-ninths, that, you do the same thing. 
you do the exact same thing. Jesus called you to be a sheep, and you go, that's an incredible privilege, and the next thing you know, he's calling you a shepherd. That's why the finest leader in your congregation may be a 17-year-old boy or 14-year-old girl. You give them no idol, I mean, no, no idol. You give them no title. I think that's the right word I want. You give them no title. You give them no office. They've gotten a, didn't have to, Jesus did, because they got it. And they pick up the mantle of responsibility for the care of God's people. Nobody in this room can dismiss this sermon because, well, this is about leadership. No, this is about maturity. Flip side of this, let me take the other path. This other path that comes to this issue of leadership, there really will be people, knuckleheads like myself, that at some level, we have a title or an office. Maybe you're on the church council. Maybe you're teaching Bible school classes. Maybe you are a youth sponsor. Maybe you have something. And can I tell you, for the most part, I've met some of the most profound, wonderful people on that road, and I've met some of the most lost on that road you can possibly imagine because we have traded out kingdom leadership for the world's leadership, and it's a train wreck. I've been a lot of places through life, and somebody wants to know who I am, and I will not tell them I'm a preacher. Oh, my goodness, because I want them to think higher of me than that. <laughs> so if I really want to impress them, I, I, I tell them I'm a welder or something, you know, because why? Because it's humiliating how much we've lost the kingdom call. You guys, and I, I'm going I'm, I'm to come right at you. You guys are in transition as a congregation. You're in transition for a lot of reasons. One is because the culture you live in has gone through an earth shake, or earthquake. You, you think Turkey's had an earthquake. You are in a culture. I look out these beautiful windows and at this, at this town and this culture, and, and we don't even know, know who lives out there. Something's changed. The ground has moved. So how do you be salt and light to them? You're going to have to raise up a congregation of kingdom leaders, Amen. or this world's going to devour itself without hope. You're in transition because of age. Just you look at about every congregation in America, and it's always been true. Who's going to be in this congregation in 15 years? You have a narrow window to shape the legacy that comes behind you. You're in a transition because. What are you going to do with the disassociation now that causes a new association, which now causes a new... How do, we, how, how do we navigate that? How do we navigate that with honor? And how do we navigate that with power? You're in transition because you, you, you're going to have somebody introduced to you later on who's going to become our pastor. I want you to know he, he, he won't be a head honcho on anything. He'll join you. And he will reflect the kind of leadership you guys are, but it better be biblical leadership. Otherwise, you cut your throat. You really do. So I don't think it's a little thing I'm, I'm going to talk about today. I want to get deep into your lives. Those of you that are dads and moms and 14-year-old girls. And Jason, I'm talking to you. No, I, I, <laughs> all of us. All of us. Turn to 1 Corinthians, the fourth chapter. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 has a context. And I want to make sure that I give that context to you. Paul, uh, Paul has been working with the church at Corinth, but they've decided his kind of leadership isn't real biblical, or isn't good leadership. They want good leaders. So they've rejected Paul's leadership, and we've found better leaders, and we're going to become this kind of leader. And so, Paul, thank you very much, but, but you're kind of the minor leagues. You can go on. A real leader is. And so in chapters 2, 3, and 4 in particular, Paul's going to take it on in both books. But in the, especially in those chapters, he's going to go, no, 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 no. You have to redeem, be redeemed not only from your sin, you have to be redeemed from your concept of kingdom leadership. Because your, your view is, 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 is every bit as broken as you were in your sin. And so he talks about leadership. If you're physically able, and no pressure on this, but if you could stand for the reading of the scripture this morning, I want to read to you, with you 1 Corinthians 4. I want to read the first five verses. Now, we're going to park in verse 1, but I want to read the first five. Paul talking about leadership and how you regard uh, leaders. This then is how you ought to regard us. As servants of Christ 
and those entrusted with the mysteries God has revealed. Now it's required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. I care very little if I'm judged by you or any human court. Indeed, I don't even judge myself. My conscience is clear, but that doesn't make me innocent. It's the Lord who judges me. Therefore, judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait until the Lord comes. He'll bring to light what's hidden in darkness, and he will expose the motives of the heart. At that time, each will receive their praise from God. You may be seated. Let's do a little biblical exegesis here. There's something we need to see. Your English Bible is plenty sufficient to discover Christ in all the depth of the kingdom. You don't need to know the original languages to discover Jesus. It's, it's plenty apparent. But every now and then you find a little Greek word that helps you get a shortcut to see it quicker. The rest of the whole book will show it in 1 and 2 Corinthians. He says, you know how you ought to regard a, regard a leader? I expect for him to say words like competency, um, uh, all kinds of things about capability. I expect him to find something, somebody who has this skill set. I I expect him to give all kinds of words that you would make on a list of a board for what you think a leader should be. And he doesn't. You ought to regard us as servants. Well, that in itself is helpful to you to go, okay, all right, so leadership is, but no, there's, there's something else here. If you've ever studied any Greek at all, I promise you, the first three days that you were in a Greek class to to be taught Greek, they taught you a Greek word because it's one of the easiest ones there is. It's used a bazillion times in scripture. It's the Greek word doulos. The Greek word doulos means servant. There's no test in heaven on this one. You don't have to remember it, I promise. Doulos. So I expect this text to say, you ought to regard us as doulos. He doesn't. He uses another Greek word. The word he uses is the Greek word, two combinations together, under rower. What? Under rower. Well, I know what an under rower is. They're in the bottom of a Roman galley ship. They're not up at the captain's chair. They're not in the head honcho seat. They're not the navigator. They're not the guy at the front of the bow. They are the guy stripped down to the waist that they have nothing. You don't attain to an under rower. You're down there on a bench with oars. You're nothing. When you've been stripped of everything, when you don't have anything, when you are no longer anything, when everything else is turned loose, when I have maybe not even my own name, I don't have my own life, I've surrendered it all, it's been taken from me, that's an under rower. And that's the word he uses. Why? Why? Because kingdom leadership is diametrically opposed to the world's leadership. The kingdom uses a process that the world does not know. In fact, we follow one who emptied himself, Philippians chapter 2. He took the ladder down, not the ladder up. Well, everybody knows that leadership is being the boss. Leadership is calling the shots. Leadership, and, 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 and Jesus goes, no, it's not. That's how the world does things. We serve people to change. We love people to transformation. We sacrifice for the sake of those we love. Paul weaves it everywhere. Look at chapter 2, 1 Corinthians. He starts in in chapter 2 of 1 Corinthians. Just one of the illustrations. So it was with me, brothers and sisters. When I came to you, I didn't come with eloquence or human wisdom as I proclaim to you the testimony about God, for I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I came to you in weakness and great fear and trembling. By the way, I'm going to be obnoxious and stick this in here. So they, they, a possible senior pastor comes, and he comes with what? No eloquence, no human wisdom, <laughs> weakness and great trembling. We would go, well, we don't want that guy. Wait a second. What if he only knows Christ crucified? I'm not trying to get ahead of you here on this, and I understand there's a lot of things to go with this, but I want to tell you we either build our lives on kingdom principles or we begin to live compromised lives where we've tried to baptize worldly things and make them what they were not. 
Paul says, I came to you and I didn't have much. We could put this in chapter 4. I could point out words like fools and hungry and thirsty and brutally treated and homeless and who work hard and cursed and persecuted. That's chapter 4. I, we could keep turning. Let's go. Let me flip over to 2 Corinthians, the first chapter. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul says, um, don't want you, verse 8, we don't want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about the troubles we experienced in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure. What? Our ability to endure, we didn't have. So we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt we'd received the sentence of death. But this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He has delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us again. On him we've set our hope. Deliver us. It is funny that God will choose a shepherd boy to be a king. It is wild that God himself would enter as a babe and Bethlehem and come out of Nazareth. It's, it's crazy God would choose an 80-year-old man who's already failed off in the desert. It's crazy God would take a, a kid out of a prison in Egypt. It is crazy that God would take inadequacies and say, that's how I will build it. Nobody in this room, you're not thriving in kingdom leadership if you're operating out of your strengths. Quite frankly, if I can borrow from chapter 12 of 2 Corinthians, Paul said, I discovered that God greatest power came out of my weaknesses. Many in this room would know Johnny, Erickson, and Tata. Others of you would not, probably too young. Johnny's a little bit older than I am. Not, I don't know how much older, but she's older than I am. But 50 years or so ago, Johnny, as a teenage girl, drove into the, dove into the water, and when she did, she broke her neck. It was a shallow, and so she didn't realize it. She's been a quadriplegia. That quadriplegia on Joni, though, has been an extraordinary life. Extraordinary. She first kind of became noticed on public scene because she would paint with a paintbrush in her mouth, and her paintings were incredible. But then she became a writer, and her books are phenomenal. And then later on, she became a speaker. I've been in rooms of 50,000 people, and or places of 50,000, and when she speaks, I guarantee you there's depth beyond. I mean, and, and you can hear a pin drop because of Joni's speak. She's developed a nation, nation, well, international ministry called, you know, Johnny and Friends. And, and Johnny's life is, is with the disabled to help them have the kind of life that honors the Lord. Johnny says that when she's at a convention or somewhere, she's her, taking her wheelchair down the hallway, somebody will ask her, Johnny, how do you do it? I just don't know how you do it. And she said, I have a 15-second answer I can give, and it's terribly inadequate, but I have one, because you only have 15 seconds. But if you really want to know how I do it, she said, I, I can explain. She said, how I really do it is pretty simple. She said, uh, at the end of a long day, I'm hurting, I am miserable, I am... She said, it's a misnomer about pain and quadriplegia. She said, I'm so exhausted, I can't imagine one more day of being a quadriplegic. She said, my husband, Ken, will put me in bed at night, and I'm so exhausted, and I just, I almost dread one more day of having to live this way. She said, the misnomer, I hurt. She said, my hips will hurt, my shoulder will hurt in bed, but I can't move myself. And so she said, I kind of set a limit. And I can't remember. She says three or four times a night, she'll allow herself to wake her husband up to say, Ken, can you move me because my hips hurt? She said he has to get up at 4 o'clock in the morning. This is a story from probably 10, 12 years ago. And she said, I don't want to bother the poor man. He, he also has a hard thing to carry. So she said, I, I lay there and I cry. And she says, tears run down and go into my ears and off my earlobes and onto the pillow. And she said, I, I just cry out to God. God, you know my pain. God, you know how hard this is. God, you're going to have to meet me. She said, I quote scripture back. I memorize scripture because I want to quote it back. But she said, it is so difficult. She said, my husband gets up at four and goes to work. And she said, I can hear my girlfriends in the kitchen preparing the coffee. And they're going to come in in a little bit. And they're going to bathe me. And they're going to put my makeup on. They're going to dress me, brush my teeth. And she said, I, I, I say to myself, God, I don't have anything. I don't even have a smile to give these poor, sweet women who are going to come look after me this way. God, if you don't loan it to me, I don't have it. And she said, here's the most profound thing I can tell you. 
Whatever my ministry is, it's not out of my strengths, it's out of my inadequacy. And she said, I will tell you for, at that time she said 40 years, but I will tell you for 40 years, God has met me every day. And I am inadequate, but Christ is not. I am inadequate, but God is not. And every day I found, discovered his mercies are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. And she says this, there's nothing wrong with the average Christian leader other than he's too arrogant and he doesn't depend upon the Lord enough. There's nothing wrong with a typical Christian other than they're too arrogant and they don't depend upon the Lord enough. She said, there's really nothing wrong with the Christian community other than we're too arrogant and don't depend on the Lord. She said, when I pray for you, I pray for greater brokenness. Because brokenness is the key to kingdom leadership, not competency. It comes out of the bottom of the Roman galley ship. It doesn't come out of the captain's quarters. A friend of mine named Glenn Elliott, one of the sweetest guys I know, he's, when I grow up and get older, I'm going to be like Glenn, he's about 10, 12 years younger than I am, but, but I want to be like Glenn. Glenn's a sweet guy. Glenn spent a lot of time um, in, the, in the Ukraine. In fact, I, I, I follow Glenn regularly to know what's actually happened with Christians in their houses. And I mean, it's, it's incredible stories. But Glenn was the preacher of a church in Tucson, Arizona for many, 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 many years. Glenn was the youth minister in the church of 6,000, 8,000, something like that, somewhere in that range. And they asked the, the, if he would take over as the, the preaching minister when the preaching minister retired. And Glenn took a couple, three days with his wife and prayed about it and, and said he thought th- yeah, if they'd be willing, yes, he would. And, well, the church leadership said, well, we want you to. We'd like you to take over as the preaching minister. But we have an outside group, it's a leadership group, Christian leadership group. We want you to meet with them for a few days at a a kind of a retreat center and they'll they'll kind of debrief you and work with you and kind of give us some feedback and you some feedback. So he said he met with them the first night. This is a wonderful meeting and they asked him, Glenn, do you think you are much of a leader? Well, you need to know this sweet, humble guy. You know, I mean, he's not arrogant in any stretch of the imagination by what you and I would see at all. and he said, well, I, kinda, I guess kind of. He said, I kind of led in high school, and I kind of led in college. And I, yeah, I kind of led a youth group in a pretty good-sized church. And yeah, I have, yeah, I, I think I have some gifts of leadership. They talked quite a bit. At the end of it, they said, Glenn, we're not sure you really understand kingdom leadership. In fact, we're going to recommend... We're going to meet at 8 o'clock in the morning, but we want you to go through the New Testament, and we want you to actually challenge your own view of leadership. We'll see you in the morning when you've read Scripture. Glenn said, I kind of walked out a little puzzled, went back to his room. He said about 1.30 in the morning it hit him. He said, I just started bawling because it was so clear. How did I miss it? For what it's worth... I've kept these words written on the top of my page of 1 Corinthians 4. Here are the words. He said, I realize that leadership in Scripture is never tied with what I thought it was. It's tied to these words. Humbled, broken, nothing, weak, foolish, lowly, Inadequate to the task, suffering, hard work, tears, perseverance. You want to know why some of you are failing as the father you want to be? It's not because you're failure. Your failure hasn't driven you to your knees enough. You want to know why some of you are failing in the different things you're doing? It's because... We're all inadequate. God brought me as he brings you. Just a broken sinner. All of us have a certain amount of doofus in us. That's just who we are, okay? And God doesn't bring me to where I'm capable. He brings me to a place that I must always cry out. Because if I ever stop doing that, I become King Saul. I become Absalom. I become Solomon. I become Nebuchadnezzar. I become John chapter 12. They love the glory of men more than they love the glory of God. I become the person who can't even recognize the glory of God in front of me because I'm clinging to my own glory. I want to make sure I get enough respect. I want to make sure I'm obeyed well enough. I want to make sure 
There's nothing wrong with any of our conflicts in life other than we think too highly of ourselves. Any marriage in this, in, this, in this room that you have high tension off and on in your marriage is because somebody's thinking in those occasions too highly of themselves. Any conflict you have as a family, somebody's thinking too highly of themselves. It's just a reality. It's the reason the Lord says he's opposed to the proud and he gives grace to the humble. So what are you going to raise up to handle this future as a congregation? What are you going to be? What's your maturity going to look like? We're desperate people who need Jesus. I'm inadequate, but he is not. I'm not enough, but he is. And humble people, humble people. That's the first one. By the way, I'm going to put this in, a, in this framework. The first great destroyer of leadership is always arrogance. And the great antidote is humility. If you don't think so, look at our public stage in politics for a little bit. But there's a second thing. The second thing's also in, in, in this same verse. This then is how you have to regard us as servants of Christ under rowers of Christ and those entrusted with the mysteries God has revealed. That word there is entrusted in my NIV version. It's actually the root word. It's, it's the word that we use for stewardship. Now, we don't use the word stewardship in everyday conversation at all. You hear the word stewardship, you pretty well know you're at church. Okay, let's start with that one. And we know something about finances is about to happen, okay? It either has to do with giving or a capital fund drive or something's about to happen. Stewardship. We, but that's not how they used it. Stewardship, as they used the word, had to do with a high relational trust and responsibility. High relational responsibility. High relational trust. Let me give you the best way that I could probably illustrate it out of my own life. I have three, uh, you can't call them kids anymore because they've got grown kids of their own. But, but my middle child um, is Katie. Uh, my oldest is a son, and then Katie comes along. Katie was at that time, had just graduated from PA school. She was doing orthopedic surgeries, and Josh was dating her, and he's an engineer. He's an engineer with General Electric. And he gives me a call and wants to know if he can meet me for breakfast. Well, I knew what was up. I mean, you know, um, so we go to breakfast and we go for that breakfast. And sure enough, Josh said, hey, Randy, I, Mr. Garris, he didn't say Randy, I promise you. Uh, Mr. Garris, I, w I would, you know, I didn't mind, but he was so nervous. Uh, I I'd like your blessing to ask your daughter, you know, to, for her hand. Well, I was going to tell him, yes, he is such a great guy, but I wasn't going to let him off the hook that easy. And honestly, it's a pretty tender moment if any of you have been raised daughters and then you have to hand them off to a barbarian or something like that. <laughs> and I said, Josh, you'll like my answer at the end, but Josh, can I talk here for a second? And I said, and I just began to describe, I just began to tell my story of what it was like to be handed this little girl and pony back rides and a little girl on your shoulders. And sitting there beside her when she's playing the scales as a first or second grader to piano. And 40 bazillion rebounded basketballs back to her. She turned out to be six foot tall. In its core, I said, Josh, God has been writing and this girl is incredible. Will she be safe with you? Are you a man who will... And Josh just began to cry, this engineer. And he, he basically said, I, I want to partner with God. I want, I want to be the raw material that God can use to write a grander story in her life. I want her to always be safe. And, 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 and it was a tender, tweet, sweet conversation. And at the end of it, Mr. Garris, I give you my word. And he shook my hand and we exchanged 37 camels and, you know, <laughs> three sheep. And, <laughs> And he married Katie. Their oldest daughter is a sophomore in high school now. But I look at all my kids and their spouses and those things, but Josh and, and I've said many times, I wish my own kids were raised by as fine a people as these are raising my grandkids. Josh has been more than faithful to that word. That's a stewardship. 
You realize, don't you, that while you are, have an inadequacy from the Lord, here's the second thing that you have. You have a high relational trust. It's a pretty simple question from the Lord as well. Are my people, the people who know me and the people who don't know me, will you care for them? Will you be the light? Will you be the face of Christ? Will you be the one who gathers them up out of a ditch when they've been beat up? Will you be the one? Will you love them? I'm going to use two words. The two great destroyers of leadership can be either one or both. Arrogance. And the second one is cowardliness. Not picking up. You know what a great leader is? Humility and courage. It's the willingness to pick up the mantle of responsibility for what God has asked me. And if you're living a small little life with your hands in your pockets and you're not really loving people, you're not really stepping into people's lives, I'm not asking you to bully in. No, a humble person can't do that. But I am asking you this. Have you lived too cowardly to actually be mature or to be a real leader? Leaders who fail are almost always individuals who either applied arrogance or or cowardliness. What's courage look like? I was speaking at Libby, Montana several years ago, and uh, at the end of the day, we were all a bunch of guys sitting at a camp and talking, and well, there was, a, I think, a major, retired major career military. Might have been higher rank than that, I can't remember. But somehow courage came up, and he said, would you like to hear the, the spot I've seen the most courage ever? Well, this is career military, so we're expecting some kind of, he said, it's not what you think. And he told a story. The story's pretty simple. He said there was a military base. In this military base, things were crazy. And, and he said it had turned into a, more of a country club than it had turned into an actual military base. And he said, we got a new base commander. And the new base commander was humiliated at what he found. He, he just angry at what he found. He, he, it's, it's crazy. And so he said there came a day that he decided these are the changes and we're taking away the perks and the privileges of all of these officers the way they've been abusing it. And he stood a private, a private at a gate and a door and that private's job was to tell career military officers no all day long. He said that guy stood there. He said, I went by that afternoon, saw him, he said, that guy was so mistreated. He'd been called every name imaginable. He'd been dressed down. He had been, he had taken all the ire. And he said, the guy's eyes were red and his nose was running from crying. And he said, it had been a tough day for that kid. He said, I happened to be there when the base commander comes walking up. Well, the kid goes into a salute. Base commander returns a salute. And then the base commander turned to the private and said, stand at ease. And that's a command. He kind of put his hands down. The base commander slowly saluted the private. The kid started to put his hand up, and he said, I told you to stand at ease. And after the base commander saluted him, he reached out his hand and shook the guy's hand and said, Son, thank you. You don't know how deeply I appreciate this. He said, I know I put you through hell today. But you did what I asked, and you did it well, and you did it faithfully. Thank you. If I understand anything about your day to go heaven, there's somebody who's going to say to you, with a crucified hand, thank you. You picked up the mantle of responsibility for my people. You did it as a sophomore in high school. You did it as a junior in college. Maybe you did it as a mom with that circle of moms. Maybe you did it in the school, and the school is so counterculture to what you would like to be, but you are the light and the salt. Maybe you do it as a father. I don't know how you do it. But at some point in time, you've got to decide, Christ, I'm yours. And I'm inadequate, but you're not. And what you've called me to is a stewardship. And here I am. I'm going to try to keep you from ordering pizza in. I want to say one last story, and I probably shouldn't just due to time, but I'm going to stick it in. I know what your obstacle to courage will be. I, I do. Well, one of the obstacles. 
Her name is LaRosa Russell. LaRosa Russell um, adopted 18 special needs kids. She adopted these uh, special needs kids because nobody else, they were in institutions, and she just kept gathering them because nobody else would. And Time Magazine or one of those interviewed her and wanted to know. And, 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 and so, uh, what's the hardest thing? She said, well, it's two, two hard things. One you'd expect and one I'd, you wouldn't. She said, the first hard thing is making these kids actually understand they're loved. She said, they don't believe they're really loved for a long time. She said, that's the first hard thing. But she said, you can do that. She said, the second one is the voice of the critic. She said, no matter what you do, she said, if I take them to a park, I'll get some note under my windshield that I didn't do it right. If I, if I live in a community, I'll, I'll get notes, anonymous notes that are sent to me that I didn't do something right. And she said, the voice of the critic is almost endless. She said, I've tucked these kids in bed at night. And she said, I'll have a, a letter or a note, an email. And she said, I just bawled because somebody said, you're not doing it right. She said, it's not hard to love people. It's hard to decide that I don't bow to the voice of the critic. I'm not asking for a chip on your shoulder where you're angry at critics. I want you to learn anything you can from a critic that you ought to learn. Oftentimes, your enemies will tell you more truth than your friends will. But here's what I'm going to tell you. You will never serve Christ well until you destroy the idolatry of I have to be liked by everybody. You can never serve Christ well when you have the idolatry that I have to be always understood. You can never serve Christ well that I have to have the agreement of everybody around me. You can never serve Christ well unless, what you, unless you also know it means standing at a door there will be an awful lot of hard things that come my way. But Christ, you're worth it. Christ, I'm inadequate, but, but you're not. And Christ, you are my king. And if you've asked me to stand, I will stand. I think communion actually flows naturally to what we're about to do. I'm going to ask you to give two thoughts in particular. I don't think that's complex. Many of us think many things at once, so let's think two thoughts. Here's one. If it weren't for your sin, Christ would not have been at the cross. It's my sin. I can't blame somebody else. It wasn't Romans that put him there. It's me. I'm a sinner. And Christ died for sinners. There's a gratitude that comes up here. And so part of what I want you to think about is, yeah, I, I, the death and atonement of Christ. But the second one is a pretty profound juxtaposition. And I'm being invited to the table of the Lord. That he prepares a place for me. That he calls us sons and daughters of the Most High. That he puts his Holy Spirit in us and calls us temples of the living God. There's not one ounce of arrogance in that. There's great humility, but there's a courage out of coming to understand who I am. Today, as you take of the Lord's Supper and instructions, you, you, I'll let Jason give them here in a second. When you come, would two things be present? Great humility and a great courage of faithfulness. Would two things be absent? arrogance, and cowardliness. May God bless us as we meet at the table here in a moment.